y'all. Thank you. I don't want to get it. Thank you. Thank y'all. That was very sweet. Thank you. Wow. Well, thank you. I had no idea they were doing that. Um, but we've sung that song a bunch of times in our car, so they were ready. Uh, we have sung that many, many times. Uh, just overwhelmed by God's goodness. Thank you, uh, Janae and Josiah and Al Ray. Uh, if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to the book of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Perhaps one of the most glorious chapters in all of the Bible is 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Not because any chapter lacks in truth or power, but because of its subject, it is none less than the greatest rendering of the resurrection of Jesus. But it starts with this word about the gospel. And uh, we shared last week, we looked at together, uh, this series of sermons titled The Best News which is really focused on the gospel. And we talked about last week why it's such a powerful message because it's the only way by which we can be shamed, so, uh, saved. Something for which we should not, cannot be ashamed. And we're going to find out today even more why the message of the gospel is to be the message of the church. And so if you found your spot, 1 Corinthians 15, I want you to turn with me there to verse 1. And uh, you'll see it behind me as well. Will you please stand with me as I read aloud this passage and you follow along with me. 1 Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul writes, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. Will you pray with me? Lord, thank You again today for this, Your Word, which gives to us the greatest message in all of the Scriptures and therefore the greatest message for the church and for the whole world, the Gospel. Jesus, You died, You were buried, and You rose again. And through faith in You, we can be saved. Through faith in You, a broken life can be made whole. Lord, I give you thanks that by your mercy you would make it known to us. Oh, Lord, I pray, please, that though we may have heard it many times before, that our ears today would be fully open to the message of your truth so that once again we are transformed. But more than this, God, we are compelled to share this, the greatest message there is nothing else for which we should give our lives, no other thing for which the church should be more focused upon than the gospel. Please, O oh Lord, today, compel us in this. Jesus, we ask it in your name. Amen. <clears throat> you can be seated. Thank you this morning for uh, your attention in worship today. As we have uh, sung together, prayed together, given together, and now we go to His Word together. Uh, I heard a story about a football game, actually decades ago now. It was when a, a coach by the name of Duffy Doherty was coaching Michigan State Spartans, and they were playing the UCLA Bruins. <clears throat> And in this game match, it was going back and forth, and finally it came down to the final quarter. In the final seconds of the game, it was tied at 14 apiece, and Michigan State was in line, in place, to send in their field goal kicker and kick the winning kick. And that's exactly what Coach Doherty did. He sent his kicker out there to kick, and uh, they snapped the ball, and the kicker kicked the ball, and it was good. And they were celebrating. They had won the game. And that kicker came back off the field, and the coach told him, "Good, great kick, son. He said, but I've got a question for you. I noticed when you kicked the ball that immediately upon kicking it, you didn't even watch the ball. 
You didn't even seem to be looking that direction. You, you turned immediately and said, well, coach, there's a good reason for that. He said, because I wanted to look at the referee standing beside me. I wanted to know whether it was good or not. And he said, well, why didn't you just watch the ball yourself? He said, well, coach, I hate to tell you this, but I forgot to put in my contacts this morning. I couldn't even see the goalpost. Listen, <laughs> it's important to have your priorities in line, isn't it? To put first things first in all matters. They're important. Life, in fact, is about keeping first things first. Our first president, the great statesman and general, George Washington, was so revered at the time of his death that it was quoted by his peers this. He was first in war first in peace, and first in the hearts of his countrymen. He was our first general of our armed forces. He was the first president of the United States. And he was selected as such because he had a keen practice of keeping first things first. And this concept has never been more important than right now, especially for the church. To keep first things first Whatever those things are and might be, as we'll see in the scripture today, it's very important in our current culture that we make certain we're about the first things first. There's a, a little clip that I like to watch with, uh, uh, well, our whole family likes to watch it, uh, me and Josiah, especially in the fall when football season is around and college game day, the show that comes on ESPN on Saturday mornings comes on. There's a little clip they do and it's called, You Have One Job. Maybe you've seen this. And it's funny little things that happen and they talk about how a, a player or a fan or someone surrounding the state, they have one job to do and they didn't do it, right? I remember last season seeing this clip of a, the entire field goal team went out, right, to, uh, uh, to prepare to kick the extra point just seconds to go before they could do that. And, and everybody's ready and the holder's down on his knees and, and where's the kicker? He turns around, the kicker's on the sideline sitting down there saying, you had one job, right, to go out there and kick that extra point. Listen, the church has one job. Has one job and it's very important. Jesus makes it very clear what is the job of the church. He, he tells us in Matthew chapter 28. It's called the Great Commission. If you don't know the Great Commission, you need to know the Great Commission. Right, Jesus said that we are to go into all the world and to proclaim this gospel and to make disciples of all nations, right? That, that, is, that is what Jesus said to us is that we are to be about, the priority, if you would. In fact, even in our mission statement as a church, we have included this as the last point because we believe it to be so vitally important. We, we say God's put us here to love, to live, and to lead. Well, look at lead again as we describe in our mission statement what we mean by this. Leading means this. We are committed to the great commission found in Matthew 28 of leading people to become fully devoted disciples of Jesus Christ. We will lead by praying, giving, serving, and going to impact our world with the gospel of Jesus Christ both locally and globally. We consider it to be so important that the scriptures tell us this is exactly what we should be doing. And listen, not only is this the business of our church, but we will go out of business if this is not the business of the church. Does that make sense? We're to make disciples here and globally. And now, no, this is not the only message of the Bible. The gospel is not the only message. The Bible gives us direction uh, for fathers, for mothers, for children, for families, for uh, workers, uh, for decisions that we make. Uh, there, there's countless gems of wisdom in the scriptures on all types of subject matter and things. But the gospel is the most important message. It's not the only message, but it is the most important one. And, and, and Paul makes this very clear, as we're going to see in just a moment. Uh, some people may be thinking, well, Jason, you might say that, but I think that there may be some other messages in the Bible that are more important than this. Listen, this is not something I made up. This is what we read in the Scriptures. In fact, Paul, who wrote 1 Corinthians that we read just a moment ago, uh, we consider him to be one of the greatest Christians of all time, and he at least is the most prolific writer of the New Testament, discussed and written about his writings more than any other. And this is what he would say. Remember, I read it a moment ago in verse 3. For I delivered to you as of first importance, priority number one. 
When Paul said, I need to tell you some things, here's the most important thing that he would tell us, the gospel. Uh, this particular series of messages is very uh, important in the life of our church right now, the best news, and I designed this specifically because uh, this week we have set aside our current week starting tomorrow to begin promoting what we've called Mission Moundville. And we want to be involved in activity and, and putting ourselves in places where we're just loving on the community of Moundville. And we've got some things set aside this week that you can read about and you'll hear more about at the end of our service, ways you can be connected. This all is keenly important to that because we want to show our community that we love them, but more than this, that God loves them. And how's the best way we can do that? Well, by giving them the gospel. That's the best way we can do it. It's not the only way. It's not the only way we're going to do it. We're going to serve children. And listen, uh, we're, we're going um, to have activities and events. We're going to knock on people's doors and give them information about uh, things that are upcoming for families and, and things that are ongoing. We're going to be doing work in the community for different things. And we have ongoing ministries every week. Uh, we, we house a, a, a food closet, food bank, where people come every single week. And we, we give to missionaries. Listen, there's so much that our church does on a daily and weekly basis. But the most important thing is the gospel. All those things are just wheels for the gospel and for its message. It's the most important message for this community. It's the most important message for your life and family. It's the most important message for our church to be telling the world, listen, we want to make the community a better place. We do. God's called us to this. But that's not our main priority. Not to make it a better place, but to share the hope of the gospel that makes a, an old person new that makes a sinner saved, right? Uh, we, we can't do that through our service. We can only do that through the gospel. And that's exactly what happens is we see the darkness of evil pushed back by the gospel. We see a life change. We see people coming to faith and uh, lives transformed through the gospel. In fact, this is just a statement that we could say assuredly, and you'll see it behind me. Jesus came so that we would have a gospel to proclaim and that we would proclaim the gospel. That's why he came. Not just to make us better, but to make us new. Transform. And it's my conviction, based off of scripture, that if we are to be about anything, it should be the gospel. That means every sermon that I preach ought to be centered upon the gospel. Right, as we go through God's word together, because every passage of scripture connects to it, and God message to us in this. It means that, that if anybody ever comes to our church, whether it be to a church service, or to some event or activity we're doing, whether it be for children or youth, or whether it be uh, senior adults, or, or, or a small group, or a large group, every single time they ought to get a chance to hear the gospel. That ought to be the mission of our church. The strong conviction we have. And not only a chance to hear it, but to be able to respond to it. So if we're going to keep first things first, then I want you to note three things about the gospel that you can write down. You're going to see behind me the points as they come across your screen. In your uh, sermon notes you received today as you walk through the door, write these three things down. Here's the first. We must prioritize the significance of the gospel. The significance of the gospel. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 1, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and in which you stand. 1 Corinthians is one of the first letters, chronologically speaking, written in the history of the New Testament. And very early on, Paul is, is establishing a strong point. He says this, listen, the most important thing we have to say to you is the gospel. Many subjects he's going to talk about. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 2, he says, and he says this about the gospel. By it you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preach to you, Paul makes it very clear, there's no other message that can save you. Only the gospel. No other message contains hope for eternal life. Now listen, there may not be a more unpopular statement that I or you could make but it's this. Buddhism can't save you. Islam can't save you. Hinduism can't save you. Judaism can't save you. Any other ism can't save you. Only, only the gospel 
as told through the story of Christ. Listen, only the gospel saves. That does not make us popular in the culture today. We'll be called bigots and hate mongers for saying such evil speech. But I'm not making it up. That's what Jesus said. That's what the scriptures tell us. And so we stand upon that truth. And it, listen, unless someone hears the gospel, they will not be saved. So it's the most important message that we have that's why Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 15, 3, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. <laughs> it's most important. It's the most important message of the church. And I, I want to make, make sure so carefully that even when I uh, am working on my sermons that I prepare throughout the week and then bring to you on Sundays or on Wednesdays when I'm teaching, that I'm teaching about the gospel, whatever subject matter it may be, that I'm presenting it as clearly as I can. And I, I, I seriously sit down and think, okay, how can I weave the gospel into this sermon so that it's heard and people can respond if you've never read the entire book of 1 Corinthians, you really ought to. It's a pretty exciting read. It, it almost reads like a tabloid in today's times. I mean, uh, Paul would write to this early Christian church that he had helped to start, and it would almost fit into a reality TV show today. Some of the subject matters of which Paul would speak that were going on in that church, he would have to speak to them about incest, sexual matters, Christians suing other Christians, what it means to be married, what it means to be single, how to deal with temptation. And he even had to deal with the fact that when people were gathering together for worship and celebrating the Lord's Supper, that some of the members were, were getting blasted, right? Uh, they're getting drunk there at the Lord's Supper at a time of worship. He had to deal with all these subject matters. Listen, there were many issues with which Paul had to deal with Corinthians, but this is what he said in, in 1 Corinthians 15. This is the most important issue. All those other things fall behind this one, the gospel. It's of first importance is what he would say. Um, I love more now, I think, when I was in school, American history. I like to read a lot of books about great battles in American history, uh, particularly involving the American Revolution. I've read several books on George Washington. And uh, I have become familiar again with a story that I had forgotten. A really rather amazing story about his life and a, a matter involved with him, though. Because what we find is, is there was an occurrence surrounding his life and a battle he was involved in that involved a message that was ignored. And it turned the course of not only American Revolution history, but really uh, world history. Because of a message that was ignored. You may uh, remember that on the night of December, or actually the morning of December 26, 1776, just a day after Christmas, George Washington would lead his embattled troops across the icy Delaware River. There's a famous painting of this. And really, uh, the Americans were on their last leg at this point. Uh, the, the revolution was seemingly lost. They had not won any battles. And they just needed a win of some sorts to give them some confidence in the war itself. And so he led these soldiers across what would be a sneak attack on the town of Trenton, New Jersey. And there were the Hessians who were controlling that area. Hessians, if you did not know or remember, were German mercenaries. These were men paid to do battle. These were skilled warriors. But it was to be a sneak attack the day after Christmas. It was cold. It was icy and snowy. And the, uh, uh, the, the colonel in charge of the Hessian forces there was a man by the name of Johann Rawl. And when he was asked that night if he believed the colonists would by any means attack his position there in Trenton, this was his exact quote, those clodhoppers would never attack us. At midnight, a note was delivered to Johann Rawl. He ignored the note. He was too busy playing cards. He put it in his coat pocket. Just a few hours when day would break that morning, the American forces would come upon those Hessians there in Trenton, New Jersey, and they would overtake them. They stood no chance. They were still uh, hungover from the night's celebrations before. Rawl himself, Colonel Rawl, was mortally wounded, and as a surgeon would begin to tend to his wounds, he was laid out on a table, and he opened up his coat, and out of his coat fell that note that he never even looked at. 
It was a note that was given to him by a sentry who had given the report. George Washington and his troops are coming across the Delaware for a sneak attack. He had ignored the message. Colonel Raw, before he died, stated this, If I had only read the note, I would not be here. You see, American and world history changed because of a message that was ignored. A message that was never read. Listen, as a church, we cannot neglect or misread the most important message. Every Sunday before our larger gathering, we've been doing this now for some time. We have a group of people, anyone's invited to come, but we have a group of people that gather here in this sanctuary and we, we come together and we pray for the services in the day and the events of the day and our church and sometimes particular needs that we're made aware of. We don't spend a lot of time. Sometimes we'll, we'll spread out through this sanctuary and, and the people that are here will pray over the seats. And listen, this is what, what I'm always praying. Lord, please let your gospel be heard. Please let it be received. Please let the broken lives that come to this place be transformed by your power. Please let those who don't have an assurance of eternal life come to find life that's only found in the gospel. Why? This is the most important message, the gospel. Now, it's not just that it's the significance that we must prioritize, but also, here's the second thing I want you to write down. We must recognize the substance of the gospel. What is the substance? I mean, we've looked at the priority of it, but what is the substance of it? Paul goes on to explain to the church in Corinth exactly what the gospel is. Now, this was really important. See, when, when Paul wrote this letter, it was only about 20 years following the death of Jesus. Listen, the people whom Paul is writing to, many of them were alive when Jesus was crucified. They knew the story personally. Perhaps some of them were eyewitnesses, or at least they had relatives or friends who were eyewitnesses of these events. And so uh, these were things they, they knew about his death, they knew about his resurrection on a first or second hand basis. And yet Paul says, but let me explain something to you very plainly, lest we forget this. And he says this, there are three parts to the gospel that are laid out here in this passage we've just read together. Here's the first part you'll see behind me. First thing is this, Christ died for our sins. 1 Corinthians 15, 3. Paul says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. Paul says this is the first most important part of the gospel. Jesus died for us. Now when it says that Christ died for our sins, the Greek word there actually means in behalf of or on behalf of. You see, Christ died on behalf of your sins and on behalf of my sin. He points this out because death was and is such a common occurrence, isn't it? Listen, people die every day. People are going to die today. People are going to die tomorrow. And until Christ returns, death will continue to be a major business in our world. It's such a common occurrence, and yet there was something significant about Jesus' death. And listen, it wasn't just because he was crucified. Did you know that in the time of Jesus, it was a very common occurrence for Rome to crucify those who would oppose their authority? Criminals, as they would call them, Jesus was crucified in this way. And so it's not just that Jesus' death in itself is significant because he died or, or necessarily because of the manner in which he died. No, there's something else to this. It's because he died for our sins. Uh, you won't know this name, and it's really unimportant that you do, but there was a gentleman by the name of Dr. Harry Reamer. About 100 years ago at the turn of the century, he was a, a Christian apologist and scientist, very intelligent. And, and he served oftentimes as a lecturer at major universities. On one particular occasion, he was lecturing at Harvard University. And he was lecturing on uh, creation. He was lecturing on Christianity and on the gospel. And as he was having this lecture, at the end of it, he had a, a student who raised his hand and asked a question about his lecture. And it just so happened this young man was a Jewish uh, a student, a Jew. And he stood up and he, he asked this question. He said, I understand that Jesus was a Jew and I'm a Jew. And he said, I, I want to know, what made Jesus so unique and special? 
And Dr. Reamer replied, well, he said, since you're a Jew, you would know that in the time of Jesus' lifespan, there were roughly 30,000 Jews that were crucified by the Roman Empire. Did you know that? And the young man said, I had no idea. I didn't know that. He said, that's right. So he said, oh, let's just do a little, if we'll do a little exercise with me. He said this, Dr. Reamer said this. He said, I'll name a Jew who was crucified out of 30,000, and you tell me another one that was crucified. He said, I'll tell you one, Jesus. He said, now, can you tell me one other Jew among 30,000 that was crucified? He said, come on, out of 29,999, certainly you remember one other Jew who was crucified. The young man said, I, I can't name one other one. He said, I'll tell you why you can't. Because there's only one Jew who was crucified for our sins and who rose again. That's what makes his death unique. He died for us. You see, that's what makes the gospel so unique in this first part of it, that Jesus died for our sins. Now, not only does Paul say that he died for our sins, but he goes on to say, secondly, this point, Jesus was buried, right? This is what 1 Corinthians 15 tells us, that he was died for our sins, but also that Jesus was buried. 1 Corinthians 15, 4, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scripture. Here again, he was, he was buried. Now, this sounds rather redundant, doesn't it? Uh, this is what happens to dead people. They get buried, right? I mean, this, this is the natural course. In fact, did you know there's only one requirement for your burial? That be that you are dead, right? I mean, if, if I were to have a conversation with my family and told them, listen, there's only one thing I want you to do at, at the time before you bury me. That's make sure I'm dead, right? Make certain that that's a settled issue. Like many other events in the life of Jesus, you may not know this, but his burial was prophesied hundreds of years prior to its event. Isaiah 53, 9, you'll see behind me. Isaiah would write this about Jesus' burial as a prophecy. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death. You see, it was important that Jesus was buried. Here's why. Because it verified that he was dead. You bury dead people. See, many would claim... Upon his resurrection, many would claim Jesus could not rise. This is impossible. And one of the theories about how Jesus, it was, it was uh, put forth that Jesus wasn't raised from the dead is a theory was, well, he didn't really die. Right? That makes sense. I mean, you don't have to rise from the dead if you're not really dead. And so there was actually uh, about two or three hundred years ago, there was a group called the Rationalists that much like the Muslims today, Muslims do not believe that Jesus actually died. They believe he was crucified, but that he didn't die. And there was a group called the Rationalists who came forth with a false theology. And this is what they taught. They, they brought forth this idea. They called it the swoon theory. And what that means is that Jesus uh, um, uh, uh, just swooned on the cross. In other words... He was crucified and beaten and taken down, but he wasn't really dead. He was hurt really bad, but he wasn't really dead. And then they, they, they took him and they laid him in a tomb, a dark, cold, damp tomb. And they wrapped his body and they embalmed him in that way. And then after two or three days of good rest in that nice dark room, he all of a sudden popped up and had the strength to move a one to two ton rock and appear to everyone as the glorified, resurrected Lord. You see, it sounds quite ridiculous, doesn't it? There was a, a man in England who wrote to a religious editor of a paper the following question. This is what he said. He said, Dear Editor, my friend and I were talking on Easter Sunday. He said that Jesus simply swooned on the cross. And then the disciples nursed him back to health. What do you think, John? This is what the editor wrote back to him. Dear John, beat your friend with a cat of nine tails, 39 lashes. Nail him to a cross. Hang him in the sun for six hours. Run a spear through his side. Embalm him. Wrap him up like a mummy. Put him in an airtight tomb for 72 hours. And then you see what happens. Sincerely, the editor. Listen. Christ was buried because Christ died. And if he died, that means that he rose, which leads us to the third point of the gospel. And it's just this, Jesus was raised on the third day. 1 Corinthians 15, 4, Paul ends the verse with this. He says he was raised on the third day. 
in accordance with the Scriptures. Why? Because it was already prophesied. He was raised on the third day. Now, there are some popular theologians, even today, even in, in some seminaries, who teach this, that Jesus, Jesus was not raised. The resurrection is false. Listen, but I want to share something with you, as Paul would say here in 1 Corinthians 15. If Jesus was not raised, then nothing else matters. The other two points, that he died, that he was buried, it doesn't matter. If he wasn't raised, it all falls through the cracks, and it's unimportant. It's the most important part. Why? Because it establishes exactly what he did. How do we know that Christ's death actually counted as payment for our sins in the eyes of God? You say Jesus died for you. Great. Well, what does that mean if he didn't rise? You see, his resurrection verifies that he paid for your sins. It verifies that God was satisfied with his wrath being paid for you. It means that eternal life can be given and it can take effect. When you go to a store and you use your card there, or cash, but usually, especially cards, because we have to keep a record of it, and we pay for something, what do they give us back? They give us a receipt, don't they? It's verified proof that this item is paid in full, or at least paid down to some degree. That's what the resurrection is. It's the proof. In fact, take note of this statement you'll see behind me. Jesus' death on the cross is the payment for our sin. Jesus' resurrection from the tomb is the receipt to us that our sins have been paid in full. It's his receipt. <laughs> How wonderful that Christ died and was buried and he rose again. Listen, what is the gospel message? It is that Jesus died for our sins. He was buried and he rose again. And if you ever hear anyone tell you a gospel that does not include these three things, it is not the gospel. This is the gospel, Paul would say. Now here's our last point that we need to see. It's not just that we see the significance of the gospel or the substance of it, but also we must emphasize the supremacy of the gospel. It is supreme. Why is it so important? Why is it the most important message of the church? Why is it the most important message of the Bible? Why is it the most important message for any one of us as a believer and follower of Jesus? Quite simply, as we learned last week, because it's the only message that saves. It's the only message that can save us. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 and 2. Again, we revisit this. We read it. Paul says, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and which you stand and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preach to you, Paul says you're being saved by this gospel. There's not another message, there's not another point, there's not another way or thing, only the gospel can do this. It's the only message that can take you from sin to salvation, from darkness to life, from death to life. It's the only message that can transform a person's life forever. You know, this week... We're going to be involved together as a church in Mission Moundville. Set aside opportunities for us to reach out to our community. These are the same type of things we have done in the past before when we've gone to other cities and other communities and we've shared the gospel. And now we're doing them right here. It's always harder to work right in your own hometown. But we're going to do it right here this week. And it's our hope and prayer that it opens up doors to share the gospel. I want you, I'm asking you, pleading with you, inviting you to be a part with us in this somehow, some way this week. You know, in conjunction with this, but on a much grander scale, I challenged you last week and I want to challenge you again. And you'll be hearing this challenge for the next couple of weeks. But you ought to have one person whom you're, you're trying to share the gospel with. One person, at least, that you're praying for. One person that you're looking for an opportunity to share the gospel with that person. Who's your one? Right? Who's your one person? Uh, perhaps you have more than one. I have more than one. But, but at least one. Each one of us ought to have one person. Listen, follower of Jesus, that you have one person you're trying to reach with the gospel and you're burdened in prayer for. Uh, we have uh, provided what we call the best news cards. They look like this. And on the back, it has a presentation of the gospel. You'll find these out at the welcome desk. 
<clears throat> we'll be using these this week. And listen, we can print as many of these as we want to. They're ours. And we'll continue printing them. And, and I keep one in my wallet and I keep one in my car. And I'm always, I want to be looking always for an opportunity. Where, where, where can I share? Where can I give this to someone? How can I, I share with them about Jesus? Who's that one? You ought to have one. I'm challenging each of you this year to have one person that you're sharing with. You should have at least one. Now, some of you might be thinking, wait a minute. I didn't sign up for this, right? That's the preacher's job. It's the preacher's job to win souls. It's not my job, right? That's what I pay the preacher to do, right? You might be thinking, I, I, I'm not that kind of person. I don't have that kind of gift. I don't have a boldness to do that. You don't know my situation, Jason, whatever the case may be. Let me ask you a very difficult question. And if it stings, it should. You'll note it behind me. If you were lost without Christ, and every Christian shared the gospel as much as you share the gospel, would you ever hear the gospel? If you were lost without Christ, and every Christian shared the gospel as much as you share the gospel, would you ever hear the gospel? If that makes you uncomfortable, good. It's designed to. It makes me uncomfortable as I want to share more and more. <clears throat> I'll give you a story in relation to this. It's been about a year ago now, a little over a year ago, that uh, I received a phone call from someone in our church. And they told me that uh, they had someone in their family was going to come, become speaking with me. And I had known him, um, knew about him, had a relationship with him. But this particular person, it was obvious that uh, he was not living his life for Christ. And um, it was obvious that, that he had made some decisions in his life that had brought some pain to his family, some brokenness there, some issues with which he was dealing. But he, he called me and said, can we meet together? And I said, absolutely. And it just so happened he came up on a Wednesday. Wednesdays around here in the afternoon are crazy. <laughs> They're cooking meals and kids are, have made my office a playground, you know. So it's just kind of hard to focus sitting in there. And so we, we went to a quiet spot, this little prayer room sitting right back here behind our sanctuary in the back. We went and we sat down in there together and we began to talk and I asked him what's going on and he just began to share with me and he said, well, I, I, I need to know how God can forgive me and I need to know for certain that, that I am a follower of Jesus and that I have eternal life. And so I just began to walk him through the gospel. That's all. Exactly what you would read on the back of this card. Uh, we just It's very simple. We just kind of walked through the gospel together. And we talked about very clearly that, that, that for him to follow Christ had to be something that he was very serious about. I will never forget the look in his eyes with a resolution still cold into me. He said, there's no question. That's what I want to do. And right then and there, Gus Stokes gave his life to Jesus. And listen, we know Gus. Many of us have known him for a long time, prayed for him for a long time. Billy and Beverly prayed with him for a long time. But you know, it's been wonderful to see over the course of the last year as the gospel didn't just take effect on the day in a room a year ago, but in his life changed his life. Why is that? Because that's what the gospel does. It changes people's lives. It's the only message that changes people's lives. There's not another message. There's not another teaching. There's not another thing we can give to somebody. Listen, we, we can't throw our money at a soul and it change. We can't throw service at a soul and it change. But if we give them the gospel... And that doesn't mean those things aren't needed. But if we give them the gospel, they'll be changed if they receive it. And as we've seen Gus grow in his faith, we've seen living proof of this. He's not the only one, is he? There are countless people in our church. There's countless people that we know that we've come in contact with that have left a broken road behind them because of their rebellion against God. And when they received the gospel, their life was transformed. 
There is not something else that can do that. Only the gospel does it. Listen, how important is it? It is so important that if the gospel is not true, nothing else matters. If the gospel is true, it's the only thing that matters. That's the gospel. It must always be put first. Not only in my preaching and teaching, but in your living, in our church's ministries, the gospel must be first. So because that is the case, I want us to just end our time in this way. You know, we have seen the gospel today. We read about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1-4. through 4. Jesus says, this is the